Welcome to our final lecture in Chapter 2 of Trigonometry. I'm Professor Michael Bailey at Dallas College. Today we're going to look at 2.5, further applications of right triangles, um, and start exploring the idea of bearing, which is one of the most widely applications, widely used applications of trigonometry. When we're talking about bearing, there are two different methods for expressing bearing or two different types of notation. The first is when just a single angle is given, such as the statement, a bearing of 164 degrees. When it's just a single angle, it's understood that the bearing is measured in a clockwise direction from due north. Notice this is a change from what we've been doing, measuring angles in a counterclockwise direction from the x-axis. What it looks like now is we're measuring from the y-axis in a clockwise direction. So bearing is going to be a little bit different than what we've talked about as a standard um, notation for angles. Bearing is its own kind of creature, if you will. Okay, so again, the second angle here you can see is a bearing of 164 degrees. So if you think of this as a Cartesian system, what we're doing is we're starting from the positive y-axis, or if you think about a compass, um, heading the heading of direction north, we're going to start there and measure in a clockwise direction whatever the angle is given to us. So this first one you can see this is a bearing of 32 degrees starting at north and going in a clockwise direction for 32 degrees to get to our terminal end. In the third one we see a bearing of 229. So we're going to start at north, we're going to pass the x-axis at 90, we're going to pass the negative y-axis at, at 180 and get up to 229. And the last one um, is a bearing of 304 degrees. Again, we're going to start at north. We're going to go in a clockwise direction, past the x-axis at 90, the negative y-axis at uh, 180, the negative x-axis at 270 to get up to 304. And those kind of, you know, I mentioned those specifically, those x and y-axis points, those quadrantals, if you will, um, because we're going to use those uh, knowledge because, you know, when we're doing true north, then we really do have a Cartesian type system here and can build triangles off of the x axis um, in connection to that. And you'll see that in just a second as we work our first problem. Radar stations A and B are on an east west line 3.7 kilometers apart. Station A detects a plane at point C on a bearing of 61 degrees. Station B simultaneously detects the same plane on a bearing of 331 degrees. Find the distance from A to C. I get it. You read this problem and it's gobbledygook. It's Greek. It doesn't make a lot of sense, especially if you've not done this before. It is very key when we're dealing with bearing problems that we draw diagrams for this. Now again, I understand that when you read this, you may not even know where to begin with a diagram. Well, like most things, start at the beginning, and as soon as you get one piece of information, draw it. Take your time. So, for example, the very first sentence says, radar stations A and B are on an east-west line 3.7 kilometers apart. This is just a straight line, left to right, a horizontal line like the x-axis, where you have point A on one end, point B on the other end, and you know that the distance between them is 3.7 kilometers. So it's a very simple to draw this blue line, and we've already taken care of the first sentence. We know we're dealing with a bearing problem, so we know that we're going to be starting from north degrees, and we know that that happens both at point A, and we're dealing with something at point B as well, because there's a bearing um, station A bearing and a station B bearing. So I've just drawn these in as well. Okay, the next thing we know is that station A detects a plane at point C on a bearing of 61 degrees. So we start at north and we go 61 degrees and then draw a line there, the terminal end of our diagram. And there you can see that. We know that from point B to there, from point B to C, this is a bearing of 331 degrees all the way around. Okay? And you can see that in red and this in red. Well, uh, this, the north 
direction with the AB line is a right angle. So we know that this interior angle of this triangle um, plus the 61 degrees has to be equal to 90. So we can figure out that this interior angle of the triangle is 29. Okay, we can do a similar thing here where we know that um, from the north angle all the way around to the negative x-axis is 270 degrees. And then the rest of it into the second quadrant will be 331 minus that 270, which gives us this 61 degree angle. Okay, if we add these two together, 61 and 29, we get 90 degrees, which tells us that um, the angle at C is going to be a right angle. Okay, so we have a right triangle, which will make it easier to find um, the distance from A to C, which is our distance of B. Okay, so I want you to look at this. If you have to rewind and, and see this again, these are a little bit more complicated. The most important part is to draw the diagram and to take your time and to draw it one piece at a time. I always say um, in math, word problems are like a good steak dinner. And if you try to put it all in your mouth at one time, you choke and you don't enjoy the steak. Cut off a bite-sized piece, um, chew it, and in, in terms of the diagram, it means um, to cut off a bite-sized piece like the first sentence and draw it. And then take the next bite and draw it and see if then you can get to this place. And with trigonometry, we're often going to be looking for triangles to solve these word problems. Okay, so we can see here we've got two angles we can use um, and we're looking for a side and we have the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse was given to us. Okay, so if we use the cosine of 29, this equals the adjacent side, which is the B over um, the high hypotenuse 3.7. So we can calculate that. We could have done sine of 61, which gives us the opposite over the hypotenuse, which would have been B as well. So we could have done either sine or cosine in this problem, and we get a simple calculation, which tells us the distance from A to C at this point in time is approximately 3.2 kilometers. Again, I, don't, I cannot stress enough that drawing these diagrams is vital for you to master bearing problems, okay? So struggle with them, but keep doing more problems until it makes sense to you and until you can draw them well. A correctly labeled sketch is crucial when solving bearing applications. Often some of the necessary information is, all, is not directly stated in the problem, and we saw that in the last problem. The bearings that were given to us were not the angles inside the triangle. We had to figure them out. And so that's why the diagram is so, so important. Notice the angles we used, the angle, the cosine of 29 degrees was not given in the problem. We had to figure that out. We also had to verify that the triangle that we drew was a right triangle because as of yet, we only have formulas for right triangles. Okay, getting back to bearing, the second method for expressing bearing starts with a north-south line and uses an acute angle. So this tells us whether we're starting from a north line, which would be the positive y-axis, or the south line uh, with a negative y-axis. And here are some examples that explain that better. First, I want you to look at the notation. Okay, this is a bearing of north by east. North 42 degrees by east. Um, the second one, and so notice that we start with the positive y-axis, just like we did um, in the last bearing problems. Um, and, and here you can, the first letter tells us which axis we're gonna start with. And here we're starting with the north point and we're going um, 42 degrees in the east direction, okay? If you look at the very last diagram, north, um, 52 by west, north 52 degrees by west, we again start in the north direction, but here we're going to go in a counterclockwise direction because it's telling us which direction to go, either east or west. Notice all of these angles in the north-south um, bearing uh, notation are only acute angles, okay? So quadrant one and two are handled by north, right? We're going to go north-east for quadrant one, 
northwest for quadrant two. Quadrant three and four are handled with south directions. And here you can see south 31 degrees by east, okay, or south by east 31 degrees. I think you can say them both ways. So we start with thinking of this as the negative y-axis. This would be the origin and um, go east into quadrant four, 31 degrees clockwise, counterclockwise, excuse me. South by west, again, we start at the negative y-axis and we'll go um, to the left or west direction 40 degrees and we end up in quadrant three, okay? So all these north by east or north by west, south by east, south by west are all um, specific to one quadrant and um, give you will always be an acute angle all right so let's try a problem here this is a very typical problem and i know students hate these to me they're kind of fun because they're kind of like a little puzzle of, um, and they're not quite as bad as the sunday crossword puzzle um, so again diagramming is important think of that stake analogy draw one thing and then move on to the next part Dr you know take a bite draw it move on take your next bite a ship leaves port and sails on a bearing of north by east 47 degrees for 3.5 hours it then turns and sails on a bearing of south by east 43 degrees for four hours if the ship's rate is 22 knots nautical miles per hour find the distance that the ship is from the port okay we got a lot of stuff in here that we need to unpack and the first thing that most students do is they read it all and it's just like again putting the whole steak in your mouth and they choke and they don't know what the hell to do okay so first let's say let's just look at the first um, sentence a ship leaves port and sails on a bearing of north by east of 47 degrees don't worry about this last part yet okay so we can draw this we know we're starting with a north by east, so we're gonna draw the compass point north, the positive y-axis. We're gonna go 47 degrees to the right or to the east, okay? So here I've just drawn a north-south um, line. I've put point A on there, and now I'm gonna measure 47 degrees to the right and draw a line heading out this direction, okay? And this would be my point, you know, where I stop at there, okay? Now we get the, we get the distance of this, and I, I'm gonna talk about this in a minute, in maybe in more detail, but remember distance is simply, we've got the time and the speed, distance equals speed times time. And you know that if you drive 50 miles an hour for three hours, you drove 150 miles. This is not, don't get all caught up in this, you know this, this is very simple, you know, kind of a known knowledge. If you're driving in your car at 50 miles per hour for three hours, that's 50, 100, 150 miles. You get that. So we find the distance of the sides simply by the speed um, that, the, that the ship is going and for the number of hours, okay? So we've got this second point. Now we're gonna start at this point and go south by east for 43 degrees. So we're gonna draw another north-south line here and then we're gonna go south by east for that direction, okay? So here's our point C. We, draw, we, we have drawn another straight up and down line, and now we're gonna start at the south direction, you can see it here, and go 43 degrees to the east. And then again, we're gonna draw a line down to point B. This is where the ship ends up, okay? The question is, how far is the ship from port at this point? Well, the line CB, remember when it turns direction, it sails for another four hours. Well, four times 22 is 88 nautical miles. Just like when it left the port, it sailed for 3.5 hours at 22 knots, and 3.5 times 22 is 77 nautical miles. So we have the length of this side, it's 77. We have the length of this side, it's 88. Since the north-south lines are parallel, then we know that this angle um, between that north-south line and the line AC is also 47 degrees, alternate interior angles from chapter one. 
we, can, we were given this direction, this degree angle of 43 south by east, and we know if you add 43 and 47, you get a right, um, a right angle. So again, we see that we have a right triangle, okay? Well, here we are looking for um, side C, and we have the two other sides. So let's continue our calculation here. And again, I want to remind you that the side lengths are found by the speed times time. And this is, again, some known knowledge that you have. Okay. Here are the calculations again for side A. The 22 nautical miles per hour and it, um, the ship sailed for four hours then. From a, side B, this is between A and C, it sailed for three and a half hours at that 22. And that's how you get the 77. So again, with a right triangle given two sides, we can find the hypotenuse because a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So we can um, put the, plug in the numbers and then calculate um, the actual distance. Notice in this problem, we didn't need to use any trig functions, specifically sine, you know, cosine, tangent, etc. Um, but we did use we did build a triangle a right triangle specifically, and then simply use Pythagorean's theorem. Okay. I cannot stress enough that the key part of these bearing problems is practicing the diagrams. And if you're struggling with that, the only way you're going to master it is to keep doing more diagrams, is to keep practicing problems where you have to draw the diagram until you get it right. Okay. Most of us have seen workers on um, highways and roads doing surveying. And this is how they are surveying these distances. They're trying to figure out the distance between two objects without actually measuring them, okay? The subtense bar method is a method that surveyors use to determine a small distance between two points P and Q. The subtense bar with length b, length b is this whole bottom line. So notice um, that q is at the center. So each of these distances are b divided by two or half of b. The subtense bar with b, length b is centered at point q and situated perpendicular to the line of sight between p and q. That's so that we have a right triangle, okay? Angle theta is measured, and then the distance d can be determined, right? We have the angle theta between um, the upper and lower. So if theta equals 1 degree, 23 minutes, and 12 seconds, and b is equal to 2 centimeters, we want to find the distance d, okay? Now here we can see that the angle, if we take just the half angle in here, theta over 2, the cotangent of that equals d over b over 2. Okay. Now you may be saying, why are we using cotangent instead of tangent, which is on my calculator? Okay. Well, typically it's easier to solve problems when you use, especially when you have a ratio or a fraction, that the unknown, the unknown is in the numerator, okay? Because notice here what we do is simply divide, multiply both sides of the equation by the denominator and we get the, the unknown quantity by itself. Otherwise, we'd have to multiply, if, if we did use tangent, then we'd have to, um, we'd have b over 2 over d We'd have to multiply both sides by the d, and then we'd have to divide both sides by tangent, which would put the tangent in the denominator, which again gets us back to the idea of cotangent, right? Since cotangent is 1 over tangent. All right, so let's go ahead and figure this out. Um, we want to first convert um, theta to decimal degrees. You don't have to do this. Your calculator can handle minutes and seconds, but if you want to, you can go ahead and convert this into um, simply degrees. 
and then plug in the values into your um, into your calculator, okay? And you should get 82.634110. You might need a little bit of head here because we haven't, um, depending upon how many problems you've done with the reciprocal functions, remember that since cotangent of, a, of an angle equals one over tangent of that angle, the way that we would put this into our calculator, two over two is simply one, so I'm not going to worry about that value, but the cotangent of this angle equals 1, 1 divided by the tangent of the same angle. So 1 divided by tangent, put a parenthesis here outside of tangent, 1 divided by parenthesis tangent, 1.38667 divided by 2, close the parentheses both, and then you'll get that answer. Okay, so um, just a little reminder about how to solve cotangent problems or reciprocal function problems with your calculator. This asks how much a change would there be in the value of d if theta were measured one um, second larger. This gives us um, theta, with, if we add another second from 12 seconds to 13, uh, it would become 13, excuse me. One degree, 23 minutes, and now 13 minutes which calculates a little bit different, 1.386944 compared to the before. We plug this in again and we get 82.617558. Subtract that from the original one and we get a very small difference of 0 0.016552 centimeters. Not so much concerned about this small distance measure. But you can see why this would be used because every small change in, in angle creates a, a more accurate small distance measure. Okay, this is a very common problem. This is actually one of the very first um, trigonometric problems. It's the way that um, ancient people, ancient civilizations were able to figure out the height of tall objects without measuring them physically um, by using the shadow, okay? And using what's known as um, similar triangles, okay? Francisco needs to know the height of a tree. From a given point on the ground, he finds that the angle of elevation to the top of the tree is 36.7 degrees. He then moves back 50 feet, and from the second point, the angle of elevation to the top of the tree is 22.2 degree, 22 .2 degrees. Find the height of the tree to the nearest foot. What? Okay, I know what you're thinking. So what we want to do here, again, is draw the diagram. Start, take a bite at a time. We're trying to find the height of the tree. So the height of the tree is our unknown. From a given point on the ground, he finds the angle of elevation. Remember, this is going up from a horizontal line to the top of the tree is 36.7 degrees. Let's draw this first. So he's standing there. We know that the angle of elevation is 36.7. The height of the tree is what we're looking for, and he's some distance away. We don't know what this distance is, so we label that as x, okay? He then moves 50 feet back from the second point. I'm sorry, 50 feet back. So he's going to go from point A to another point out here, and this distance is going to be an additional 50 feet. And then once he does that, he sees that the new elevation, the angle of elevation, is now only 22.2 degrees. So let's draw that in, okay? The distance from A to D is 50 feet, which we can see here. All of these things should be labeled in your drawings. You want to label it as accurately as possible, not just to have the drawing, but to have the numbers and axes and points and sides all labeled as best you can, all right? So now we know that 22.2 um, degrees is this angle of elevation, et cetera, and we have the height here, okay? Notice that we have the side opposite of both of these angles is the height of the tree. And the side adjacent, we have some, some values here. We have a variable and then we have an actual numerical value. So what we could actually do here, we could compare what, what trig function uses opposite and adjacent. Tangent does. We could compare the tangent of the first triangle ABC 
with the tangent of the second triangle DBC. Okay, make sure we cannot use triangle DBA yet because it's not a right triangle. We can see that the angle at A opposite what would be the hypotenuse is not a right triangle. It's actually obtuse. Okay. <clears throat> The figure shows two unknowns, x the distance from the center of the trunk to the point where he stood initially, and then of course the height of the tree. Typically when we're trying to solve a math problem for two variables, we have to have two equations, okay? As we just talked about, what we're going to use, since we've got in some form, although it's with variables, we've got two equations that use opposite and adjacent, uh, if we use the tangent function, okay? So we know that the tangent of 36.7 equals the opposite over the adjacent or at h over x. If we solve this for the height of the tree, we get um, the height of the tree is x times the tangent of 36.7. That's triangle ABC. We can do a similar thing for triangle BCD. Here, the tangent of 22.2 equals the opposite h over the adjacent. Now, this is the distance from d to c. So it's x plus that 50 degrees. So opposite h over adjacent, 50 plus x. And here, if we solve for h, we get h equals 50 plus x times the tangent of 22.2, okay? Since these are both in terms of h, we can um, set these equal to each other because the height of the tree is not different for these problems. Okay, so if we set these up equal to each other, notice what we've done is we can now solve, we, we've gotten rid of one variable in a sense, the height of the tree, and now we can solve this function um, for the value of x, and then we could plug it back into either equation to find the actual height of the tree. I'm going to go through this a little bit fast, so let's look at it. All right, so we solve these. The first thing we want to do is do distribution. So on the right side, we get 50 tangent 22.2 plus x tangent 22.2. What do we do when we solve equations? We get all the variables on one side. So we've got an x variable on this side, an x variable on that side, and then just a constant here. Let's go ahead and get rid of this x variable by subtracting it from both sides, okay? Now we've got x tangent something minus x tangent something times equals 50 tangent. A lot of students get stuck here because they, they can't figure out how to get the x by itself. Well, this is very simple. Since there's an x factor in each of these terms, we simply factor it out. And so when we factor it out, we get x times the quantity of tangent 36.7 minus tangent of 22.2. All of this is in parentheses because if we distributed it by multiplying x times each of these, we'd get back to the equation above. So the, if this is x times this quantity equals this quantity. The opposite of multiplication is division. So we just divide both sides of the equation by this um, difference in parentheses and we get x equals 50 times the tangent of 22.2 divided by make sure you put this if you're putting it in your calculator put this whole denominator in parentheses otherwise if you do 50 tangent 22.2 divided by 36.7 minus this without parentheses it's going to make this a fraction and then divide this as a as a whole number itself so whenever you're dividing by operations in the denominator, make sure that you put them in parentheses, including if it, if it was you know, a plus or minus in the numerator as well. Use parentheses with your calculator, otherwise you're gonna get false answers, okay? I would suggest you go ahead and figure out this equation, I'm sorry, figure out this value by putting it in your calculator and probably doing it a couple of times. However, we can go back and substitute that whole formula, which is what they did in the example in the book, and then just do one calculation together. Uh, I understand why they do this, because if we do this calculation, likely we're going to round that decimal point, and so we're going to have a rounding error. 
So by putting the whole equation in and then multiplying this times the tangent of 36.7, um, we avoid any rounding errors. And so we get roughly 45. So our tree's height is approximately 45 feet. I'm gonna show you some, another way of doing this with the equation of lines. I don't like the second method. I think it's more confusing. So if you wanna skip the rest of the lecture, that's fine. And I'm gonna walk through this really quickly the next three slides. Okay, this is how we can do this with a graphing calculator. Notice um, if we put uh, the origin at point D, and so now we have an X and Y axis here. Okay, so now we have an X and Y axis here. The tangent of the angle between the X axis and the line of a line with the equation Y equals MX plus B is the slope of the line M, okay? So for the line DB, the slope equals the tangent of 22.2. Now, why is that? Well, what does slope equal? Slope equals rise over run. Rise over run. And what is the tangent of 22.2 equal? It equals H, which is the rise, over the opposite, H, the rise, over the adjacent, which is the run. So notice this tangent is actually the slope of this line DB, okay? Similarly, the tangent of 36.7 is gonna be the rise or the height or the opposite over the adjacent or X, okay? Since V equals zero for the line DB, because it goes through the origin, remember the in the uh, linear equation, MX plus B, B is the Y-intercept. Well, this goes right through the origin, so B is zero. So we get the equation of line DB is Y equals tangent 22.2 times X, okay? In the second line, the line AB, we get the slope again is the tangent of 36.7, times x plus b, but notice that point A is on the x-axis, so our, our y-intercept is some kind of negative value along y, and so we're not really sure what that is. Um, we can use the point, remember that this, this point is, the point of A is actually at 50, because we know that that was, he moved back 50 feet, so the point A is at 50, zero. Well, we can use that with the point slope formula, y2 minus y1 equals m2 times x2 minus x1, plug in the values, and then we can figure out what the slope is, what the equation of the line is. If we graph both of those on our calculator and then find um, the intersection, you, the graph button is the top right button on your calculator. One to the left of that is the calc button. And if you push that, you'll see that there's a function for intersection. You've got to change your window so you can see both lines and you can see where they intersect. And then that intersection function under the calc button, um, which is one left to the graph, will we'll actually calculate this for you. I don't like this method. I think it's a little more complicated, but it's not bad for you to know both methods. Um, that there are more ways to get to Rome than just one. Sorry that took a little bit long. I don't like lectures that go over 30 minutes, um, but today you got one. So it didn't go much over, so I'm not, I didn't add a, a break in here.